Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to church. I know. We start off with half our congregation. Usually during the summer, we don't see anyone until 11 o'clock. So, wow. Would you do me a favor? Would you stand to your feet? I've been saying it for the last four weeks. I was so looking forward to September, to the church coming back, and it is good to be in the house of the Lord together. Amen? Amen. Psalm 133 says this, how good, say good, good, and pleasant it is when God's people, say that's me, that's me, live together, dwell together, sit together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head. Running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Mount Hermon was one of the tallest mountains in its area. The dew that Mount Hermon would get would cause vegetation to grow and life to flourish in that valley. Mount Zion represented the presence of God. And what the psalmist is saying here is when we gather together, when we are unified together, it is as if the blessing of life and the presence of God combine in one place. When we are together in church, that is where life is. That is where we can do life together. That is where the Lord bestows his blessings upon us. So, Father, Lord, we dwell on your word. We come together this morning with excitement in our heart because of who you are and what you have done. We join together in unity, God. And we ask, Lord, that your presence would be in this place. And, Lord, that you would bestow on us every blessing that is needed for us to face this week ahead of us. And, Lord, that we would come out of this service, Lord, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have spent time with you. Lord, we ask that you be glorified now. Lord, that we would shift out of relaxation mode. And Lord, you would help us to walk into an active mode where we would choose to worship you. And you would be pleased. In Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Let's actively worship together, church. We thank you, Lord, for your blood that washes us clean. Lord, we thank you for your love that ran down. God, I thank you that we can stand here today in right relationship with you because of you and by you. You are great. Father, I ask that as we go into your word, that you would be pleased, Lord, with our hunger for you. And Lord, as we hunger to know you better, Lord, may we not just gain information, but Lord, would we deepen our relationship with you with you. God, I pray that you would anoint my lips this morning to preach your word. God, I ask that you would anoint our ears collectively, Lord, that we would hear your word. God, that you would anoint our minds to understand it, but Lord, that you would also anoint our hearts, that we would willingly choose to receive and apply your word to our everyday life. And Father, Lord, at the end of this day, we would be a little more like you from being meditating on your word and Lord, spending time in your presence. Lord, we thank you and we worship you and we glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Matthew and worship team. It is good to be with you this morning. This morning I bring you greetings from the India Christian Fellowship out of the GTA after they had had me on loan last week as I had an opportunity to travel to their conference and they had in North Bay. I'm telling you, last weekend for our family was one incredibly powerful yet exhausting weekend. 
By the end of Saturday, after preaching three services, I go back to the hotel room. And, and as we're in the hotel room, uh, uh, bless his heart, Jameson's like, so who's getting baptized tomorrow? Because there was a baptism service that was scheduled for a few of the, few of the teenagers that were there. I'm like, I don't know, buddy. There's a couple of them that uh, have already signed up with their pastor ahead. And he's like, what do you mean, a couple of them? Are not all of them getting baptized after that revival? And he's like jumping up and down on the bed because of the excitement after spending time in the presence of God. Oh, that we would have that on a regular basis. Where we would come to church and we would leave with an excitement because we didn't just go check something off on a box. But we went and we spent time with God, worshiping Him, leaving, expecting change in our lives. We were exhausted. Sunday morning, the, uh, something happened where the headline speaker for the adult service wasn't able to be there. And I had to change my, my greeting, my, my welcome into our service. And uh, after, because it's, a, it's an East Indian conference, um, when they schedule to preach, they are not like y'all. They schedule me for like an hour and a half. And I'm like, huh. At the end of preaching, at the end of the altar call time, then I hand it back over to the, to the, to the one who is leading the whole conference. He orchestrates everything. He gets everyone to kind of come up to the front. And it's amazing the leadership skill that took place as you got all 500 plus people to, to filter into the front. And they got a picture of everyone together. I'm like, how did you do that? And everyone did it. Everyone participated. Nobody was like, no, I don't want my picture. Everyone was there because they're one big family. And as we took the picture, I was like, okay, good. We're out of here. I can drive back home and get home and see my dog. Thank you, Kim, for taking care of our dog for us while we were gone. So appreciated. And I'm like ready to leave. And it's like, no. The pastor's like, oh, and by the way, Pastor Mark will be standing right over there for the next little while. And anybody who wants him to pray with you, he'll be waiting for you over there. I'm like, are you? kidding me i have now preached for like seven hours and then after a few hours of praying after people killed children would come up and i'd be like all right i'm gonna pray i'm gonna get down on their level i get down i'm like oh that was a mistake all right next family comes by and i'm like hey guys what can i pray for and i wouldn't even stand i was like i'm so i didn't have the energy to get back up and all of a sudden my wife comes and stands and she's like he's done after this point we need to go home and i'm like Thank you, sweetheart. But the hunger that was with them was so encouraging to see. And the passion they have for Jesus. But more so what stood out to me was how they do this as a family. In between services, they had a youth service happening. Youth, when they say youth, they mean anywhere from 10 years old to 30 years old. I'm like, that is a huge bracket to try to narrow in on and keep their attention for an hour and a half. But they would finish the services and they would all come together. And it was just like walking into a family reunion as they were sitting, sitting at tables, sitting on the floor, sitting on couches, just eating some of the most amazing curry I've ever had. But it showed me how they were united together, which is where we will finish our message this morning. In a few weeks, we're heading into a study on the armor of God, where we will be looking at Ephesians chapter 6 and studying the different aspects of the armor of God. But over the last few weeks, we have been studying Ephesians. By the way, if you are visiting with us this morning, welcome. It is our, our joy and honor that you are joining us here this morning. Sunday mornings is a little bit chaotic for my wife and I, especially after just getting back from a conference and doing a wedding yesterday. By the way, Dan and Alicia Bay got married here yesterday. They had a wonderful wedding. The reception went on. We bowed out just after 10. I'm like, I've got church tomorrow, a half an hour drive back. But it was so uh, refreshing to see their love for Jesus shining through. And all of a sudden, the blessing of God on their life was just amazing to be a part of. Could you make sure that you make it a point of prayer over this next week to be praying over Dan and Alicia as they are now embarking in a whole new chapter in life, a chapter of marriage. Amen? All right. Sorry. So if you're visiting with us this morning, 
we might not get a chance to welcome you, myself, my wife, individually. And for that, I apologize. It gets a little chaotic. But we love coffee. We love tea. We love hanging out. If you are visiting with us this morning, please grab Christina and set up an appointment where we can hang out outside of a Sunday because I forget everything on Sundays. But I don't forget everything on Mondays through Fridays. I'm usually pretty good there. So if you wouldn't mind checking in with Christina, we would love to get to know you a little more than just a hi, how are you on a Sunday morning. We're going into a study on Ephesus. We've been looking at the church in Ephesus. We looked first in the book of Acts where Paul first encountered these 12 believers. That's all it was. It was 12 men that made up the church of Ephesus when Paul first encountered them. But Ephesus grew to be a passionate, vibrant church. We, last week we studied the believer's position as we jumped into Ephesians chapter 1, realizing that we are what we are only Because of him and by him. I am forgiven, not by what I have done, but I am forgiven because of him and by him. I am a part of the family of God, not by what I have done, but because of him and by him. I am gifted and anointed, not because of myself, but because of him and by him. And every one of those statements are for you as well. We read in Ephesians chapter 1 over and over again, in him in him and the understanding of this in him is because of him and by him we look at the fact that we are forgiven because of him and by him that we have a destiny because of him and by him aren't you grateful that you have a destiny in god oh, i'm sorry I, I i feel like i should be back with the the east indian conference aren't you grateful that we have a destiny with god yeah. amen Aren't you grateful that not only do we have a destiny of God, with God because of him and by him, but I have a future that is marked with a seal. That's what it says nearing the end of our passage from a couple of weeks ago, that I have a future marked with a seal, meaning I am his because of him and by him. This morning, we, we move past the believer's position and we look at the believer's practice. It is what you and I ought to be doing. How many are believers in here this morning? Then it ought to be you living a life of activity. It is time. Summer's over. Cottage time is done. Vacation time is over. It is September. And we are gathering together as the church. And it's time for us to be active. Now, we can all get busy at times. We can get so busy at times that we kind of feel like we're chickens running around with our heads cut off, spewing garbage everywhere. But what I'm talking about this morning is not just running around this way and that way, but is being busy as Christians, being active as believers with a purpose. Not just doing things for the sake of doing them, but doing them intentionally. We as a church need to be active and intentionally so. I remember a number of years ago, as I was preaching in, a, in, a, in, in Lindsay, I had one youth leader who was uh, a drama graduate from his post-secondary life. And that was his thing, was stage presentation. And, and he came to me one day, and he's like, Mark, you need to be active with purpose. And I'm like, huh? He's like, you do a lot of this. And I'm like, I do? He's like, you do. He says, you need to move, but move with purpose. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, when you preach, you need to move. So you're going to walk over here. You need to walk there and stay there and make eye contact and be purposeful there. And then move back over and come back and stay centered for a while. And then if you want to move. So a couple of weeks ago, I tried that. It's been like five, six, seven, eight years since I was told to do that. And I finally was like, all right, I'll try that. And then I was like, in my head, I had set up. I'm like, all right, no one's here. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to talk. And I'm going to make eye contact with Evan and Melissa. And all of a sudden, Sunday morning, how I practiced. I literally practiced that Sunday morning with nobody in the sanctuary going, this is where they sit. I'll come over here, and I'll be purposeful and intentional and talk to Evan. And then I'll come over here. And then service happened. And guess what? Everybody sat in different places. When he first told me to do this, he literally took some masking tape and made a square behind the pulpit the next time I went to preach and a little note saying, stay in the box. I'm like, huh? (sighs) I'm not talking about wandering on a platform. 
but we need to be active with intention. We as Christians, we need to be busy. We need to be doing things, but we need to be doing things that God has called us to do. We're looking at being today busy believers, not busy beavers, but busy believers. We're looking at being contributing Christians. We don't come to church on Sunday morning to check something off the box, warm a seat for a little while and feel like, that's it, I'm done, I'm out. No, 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 we gather together to contribute to the building and the expanding of the kingdom of God. It's, it's looking at the believer's practice today, what we should be doing. So to do so, would you grab your Bibles and would you open up to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Grab your Bibles, open up to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. When you got it, say, mm, hmm, I got it. You're faster than I can get a sip of water. Verses 1 through 10. As for you, Paul's writing to the church in, a, in Ephesus here, but it applies for us. So as for you, say that's me. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of, the, of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Say that's not me. All of us also lived among them at one time. Say that's me gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace, say it's by grace, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do, say do, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This morning, there's only one point to the message but it's an expanding point, so it starts off with this. We are created by God. The first aspect that we want to grasp from this passage and remind to ourselves this morning is that every single one of us in this room, we are created by God. Say, I'm created by God. It might sound elementary to you this morning, but let it sink in for a moment because every time you hear the words that you are created by God, it should cause a, a, a heart of gra gratitude to rise up, this thankfulness that, oh my goodness, I am, I'm created by God. That God loved me so much that he, he created me, he formed me, he made me, and I am unique in him. God created you. You are not a mistake. I don't know how many teenagers over the years that I have ministered to have had this, this, this self-confidence issue where they feel like they were a mistake, that their life has no value. Can I tell you that you are not a mistake? It doesn't matter what mom and dad said. You are created not by them, but created by God. And when he created you, he didn't just create you by like, oh, let's just make another one. No, no, he created you with purpose in mind. He created you with a little heart in mind. He loves you because he created you. I love watching my daughter do art. She is gifted in art. I love watching her, her, her draw. The other day I'm sitting on the couch and I'm just watching her draw. I'm like, did you trace that? She's like... No, I'm like, wow, 
I just love watching it. But when she's done something, she's proud of it. She's like, oh, Dad, I want to show you what I've done. I'm like, oh, okay. And then she throws it, and she's just going through. She's like, here, I want to show you this video. She videotaped this app, videoed her drawing, and she throws it up there, the whole thing be creating in front of my eyes. And she's proud of it. She loves the art that she created. Why? Because she created it. Can I tell you that God created you, and he loves you? Why? Starting with the fact that he created everything about you. He created you. This life that we have, it may be hard, but can I tell you, he created you and he's gifted you and made available to you everything that is needed for what it takes to live the life he's called. And so many, so many disqualify themselves from this passage. Like, well, if you only knew what I did, if you only knew my past, if you only knew my... It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter your past. You are not defined by your past. The, crea- the only one who can actually define you is the creator who created you. And he has created you and he's called you his children. He's called you his, his handiwork. You are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus. You are created by God and he loves you. Your past doesn't define you because what he accomplished on the cross forgave that past, deleted that past. It says as far as the east, the east is from the west. That's how far he's removed your transgressions from you. That means you can't touch them. Stretching your arms out as far as you can. Your hands will never meet if you keep doing that. That's how far he's removed your past from you. So don't be defined by your past. Don't get hung up on your past. Learn to to trust in Jesus. And if he said he's forgiven you of it, guess what? You're forgiven of that. That means now you are able, you are equipped, you are positioned to do everything that God has called you to do. And finally, Yesterday, in the announcement, or not the announcement, those speeches. Anybody like speeches at weddings? Some. Others, like somebody take the mic, sound guy, turn it off. But there was this one speech yesterday. It was really unique. As she, as she gave her speech, and she was talking about Alicia and Dan and the life trans- transformation that she has seen in not a part of this church. The one giving the speech is not a part of the church. She's giving this speech about the two of them noticing the life transformation that took place since they came to know God. And at the end of the speech, she said something that really gripped me that I had to go and correct later on that night, although she was not in a spot to really receive it, so I'll do it again later. It was the end of a reception. She said, your relationship with God puts mine to shame. I'm like, oh, I hope you come to church tomorrow because I'm preaching on that. Don't compare yourself to anyone else walking on this earth. Don't compare your relationship with God to my relationship with God. Don't compare your holiness to Hans's holiness. They're two completely separate relationships. And if anything, not one of us have attained anything on our own merit. But we're so quick to do it, aren't we? Well, I can't pray like them, so I'm not going to pray out loud in prayer service. Oh, hogwash, get over yourself. Talk to Jesus. Well, I can't get involved in that because I'm not good. Trust in the power of Holy Spirit to equip you with what's urging in your heart to do. Because guess what? That urge just might be his calling on your life. And if it is his calling on your life, most likely... From all of my experience in my past, it is going to go beyond your own natural abilities to do. Because he doesn't want you to get the glory. I can't, guess what? I can't speak in front of people. You're visiting this morning like, you're the pastor. Like, come on here. Everybody else here knows I am an introvert by nature. So much so that when I was in high school, I failed English because I could not stand in front of my class and give my final presentation. As a big bully, as a big tough guy, my knees hit, I broke down in tears and ran out of the classroom because I cannot speak in front of people. It is the same today. If you want me to come outside of the church and go give a a speech to the community about playgrounds, I'm not doing it. She's doing it. Because it's not in my natural wheelhouse. But you put it in a ministry context where God has called me to do something. 
I trust in him and I begin to walk in his anointing. And every time I open my mouth, I know that it is not me, but it is him who's speaking through me. And I trust in the gifting, the calling. He has gifted you as well. If he has placed an urge, a desire to do something, don't say, well, I'm not as good as that person. It don't matter. I don't wake up in the morning going, my goodness, I'm not as good as T.D. Jakes. I don't even bother. I wasn't called to be T.D. Jakes. You weren't called to be me or the person beside you. You were called to be you. So don't compare yourself to anyone else. All that's going to do is set you up to feel like a failure. If you need, if you need to compare at all, open your Bible. Compare yourself to the Word of God. And every time you're going to come up short, and every time you're going to go, okay, God, I need you. And you realize that, oh, it is only by the grace of God that I am here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says this, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not You are created by God. He has gifted you. It is not you, but it is God in you. Only in him and by him. You are enough. Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at your neighbor and say, you're pretty wonderful. And no matter what you're thinking in your mind, you don't have to repent for lying. Because it's biblical. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That applies for you. Because God is not a God to show favoritism. So if he wrote that about someone else, he writes it about you. I I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes found my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. He created you But he didn't just create you to place you somewhere. He created you to have relationship with you. It's not just believing in God. It is having an ongoing, daily, regular, never stopping relationship with God. No matter where you go, he's there. So you can't go and go to church on Sunday morning and they'll go live like a heathen on Monday. That's not the way it works. He's with you wherever you go. This relationship is not a pause thing. Well, we're on hold right now. We're just taking a break right now, God. No, 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 no. He wants to have an ongoing, everyday relationship with you where you are taking him wherever you go. Go. It's believing in him and having relationship and trusting that he made a way for that relationship to happen. Not by you or anything you can do to earn that relationship, but by the cross of Christ and the blood that was shed. He created you. Let's expand on that for a moment. He cre- you are created by God to do the work of the kingdom. You are created by God, and you are created by God to do the work of the kingdom. What in the world is the work of the kingdom? Number one, the work of the kingdom is spreading the love of God. Is spreading this good news of the salvation message of Jesus Christ. That God who created everything wants relationship with every single living, breathing person on this earth. He did it for everyone, and it is up to us who have received it. To let them know. To share the love of God. The work of the kingdom starts mainly with the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 28. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee. To the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority. How much? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Go, make disciples. Go, share the love of God as often as you can. It is done in so many ways. It is done not only on scheduled days. It says in the word, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope in which you have. That means you better be on your game every day. On our drive home last night from the reception, Christina was talking with me. She's like, you know, as believers, not just pastors, as believers, we're never off. As much as I joke with vacation time is over, cottage time is over, and all the rest of it, guess what? Even in vacation time and cottage time, as a believer, you're not off. You don't get to clock out at the end of the day, and neither do I. We are always on. We are always called. He has a position for us and a calling for us. You never know when the opportunity to share the love of God is going to come up. Even, get this, on the dance floor. Oh, my goodness. Last night, the songs were going, and we were dancing. We were having a good time. We are sober. We do not drink. I do not believe in drinking alcohol. I think that it gives a bad witness to a lot of people. Is it sin written in the Bible? No. But does it destroy lives? Yes. So as a leader for myself, my own personal conviction is to stay away from it because the temptation to overindulge is too great. Especially if you have an addictive personality like my own. I mean, hunting season's about to be here. Don't look for me on my days off. I will be hunting every single opportunity that I have. I get addicted to it, I understand. But, but we're on our way home last night, and she said, we don't ever get a chance to be off, do we? I'm like, no. But it doesn't feel like we're on when we're on. It just feels like we're doing life. And as we were on the dance floor last night, and, and we were being able to show people that, hey, you can have a good time and celebrate the covenant that was just cut because it's a biblical to have a celebration and to get excited about what was just took place earlier that day. So we're dancing and we're having a good time, a good, clean time. And as we're on the dance floor, I couldn't help every few seconds. Oh, my goodness, we're dancing away. And we'd get interrupted by someone going, oh, you guys are just so great. God is just so good. I really need to get back to church. I'm like, yeah. You do, you know, you know, hold on for a sec. Let's talk about that after this song. But it, we weren't even off when we were on the dance floor. You never know when the opportunity is going to come. I'm sitting at the dinner table eating beside someone that I, I've never met before. And, and, and as the speeches are happening, thank goodness I had someone to distract me from the speeches at times. As the speeches were happening, he begins to talk to me, and we talk about his life. We talk about what he does. We talk about his past. We talk about his, the fact that he believes in God. And I'm like, oh, so what church do you go to? Oh, I don't go to church. And I'm like, ha, 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 here we go. And it's opportunity now to pour in and to witness. And he, he's a man who's, who's recovered from, 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 from addictions in his past. He leads sobriety groups. He's talking about the power of God that has changed so many people's lives. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And that's why I just assumed that you go to church. And he's like, no, no, no. You know, I go sit in, the, in front of the lake, and that's my church. I'm like, oh, you know, I have some of my best encounters in the tree stand. But it doesn't take away from gathering together with the rest of the believers on Sunday that encourage and build me up. And oh my goodness, that's what we're called. Because that is not the church. The church is the body of people gathering together. That is what the church is. The water's, he's like, oh, yeah. He's like, hold on. I know that he's sober, but he's acting like he's not because he's like, oh, can I just have a hug? I'm like, it's the father-daughter dance going on right now, but okay, I'm going to show you the love of God however you feel in this moment, even if it makes me feel a little bit awkward. Can I tell you that showing the love of God is done? But the fact is, is that it just needs to be done. And not just by your pastor. That every single one of us in this room as believers are called to be active you are called, you are created by God. You are created by God to help do the work of the kingdom of God. It just needs to be done. It is the greatest news ever. It is the, the greatest life transformation thing that has ever happened to you. Why in the world would you ever want to hold that back or conceal that? So the work of the kingdom is spreading the love of God, but it's also listed out for us as looking out for those in need. 
which is why Thursday's ministry at 9.30, making sandwiches, is so important. James chapter 1, verse 27 says this, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to go to church every Sunday morning and to pay our tithes. No, 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 no. Religion, by the way, he does appreciate that because he's called us to do that as well. He says, never forsake the gathering together of the saints as some are in the habit of doing, even more so as the day his return is approaching. He tells us to give of our first fruits and our tithes and our offerings. By the way, we, didn't, we don't take a break and hand the plate in our church any longer. Ever since COVID, we've done things a little different. You can give online or you can give at the box at the back. It is a part of worship. But what it says here is that religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless It's to look after the orphans and widows in their distress. To keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Later on in James chapter 2 verse 14 it says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, go. I wish you well, keep warm, and well fed. You see the irony in this? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes. You know that they don't have them. You know they got no food. And all you do is look at them and say, go, be well fed, and stay warm. But does nothing about the physical need, what good is it? In the same way, by faith, faith by itself is not accompanied, if faith by itself is not accompanied by action, it is dead. If faith by itself is not accompanied by action, it is dead. We need to be active in our faith. Amen. We need to be active in our faith. It is not just to come and sit on a Sunday morning and be be made into fat Christians who receive and receive and receive and never be active with what we are receiving. No, no, when I sit down to a nice T-bone steak, that is to fuel my body to be active afterwards. When we come to church to sit down to a nice T-bone steak as we dive into the word of God, that is to fuel our spirit to be active in the work of the kingdom. Luke chapter 14, verse 12. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what he has done. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 44, they they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, when at whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for Me, what do all of these things have in common? All of these passages have in common. It has the the idea, the mindset of others first. The heart's position of caring for those in need and using compassion and love as a means to expanding the kingdom of God. When you make sandwiches on Thursday at 9.30 in the morning, they're not just to make sandwiches to feel good, but you are doing so so the love of God can be shown and the kingdom of God can be expanded. In doing this, you not only, when you show love, when you demonstrate love, not only do you help the person in need, but you also help those who witness what is being done. Because when you do it, you are showing God's love through you and your actions. They are seeing Jesus in you. So the work of the kingdom is spreading the love of God, is looking out for those in need. But it's also building each other up. Look back at the Great Commission. It's not just about making converts. It's not just about sharing the good news. It is about making disciples. It is about growing together. To make disciples involves walking with people in the faith. 
Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17 says, as iron sharpens iron. So, see, you didn't even have to read it. You know it. It's there. It's been said so often. As iron sharpens iron, you and I ought to sharpen one another. It doesn't say as iron sharpens iron, the pastor sharpens the congregation, although that should be taking place. As iron sharpens iron, you and I, each individual as brother and sister in the Lord, ought to be building each other up making each other more effective in the kingdom of God. The work of the kingdom involves building each other up, encouraging each other, motivating each other. This week, we went back to the gym after pausing our membership over the summer. Can I tell you that going back to the gym after two months is a little painful? But this time was different because Jameson is now 12. Last year, he would come to the gym with us and he'd go down and he'd play basketball. Then he'd come back and he'd lean over the railing and he'd look at us with his mopey face like, I want to be in there with you. But he wasn't allowed. Now he's allowed. He's 12. He's had his orientation. He's in there. And I love it. At one point this week, he comes over. He's doing his own thing. Then he comes over. He's like, Dad, can I do that with you? I'm like, I'm at the bench press. And I got some weight on there. Not as much as some people, but enough for me and way too much for him. I'm like, okay, well, you go get your weight for it, buddy, and you can do it. So he comes back with his weight, and he, he lies down there. I'm like, all right, now now scoot your feet. I remembered the lesson from Evan. I'm like, all right, scoot your feet in, arch your back. Here we go, place your hands. And I got my hand underneath the bar. I'm like, all right, you ready, buddy? Give me a set of 12. And he's doing it. One. Two, and I'm over. I'm like, you got this, you got this, you got this, you got this. And it gets to 10. He's like, okay, okay, take it. I'm like, no, no, we said 12. You got this, you got this. He's like, no, no, take it, take it, take it. I'm like, no, no, you got this. James, I know you got this. My hand is here. I'm here. I I got the bar. It's not going to fall. You got this, you got this. And it goes all the way down. I'm not touching it. You got this, you got this. And I'm all the way back. Oh, there's 11. Come on. He's like, take it, take it, daddy, take it. No, 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 you got this, buddy. You got this. My hand is, you got this, buddy. You got this, you got it. There it is, there it is, there it is. Push, 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 push. Excellent. I take the weight away from him. He's like, I did it. Yes. You did it. What was my role in that? To encourage him. Did I lift the weight? No. I took it off him at the very end. But my hand was on the bar, and I was there to make sure that he didn't get crushed and keep pushing it down. Like, not over your teeth, buddy. Not over your teeth. There you go. Push it down. Excellent. That's all I did as believers. When's the last time you stood over a bench and said to another believer, you got this. Come on. Keep pushing. Don't give up. Don't stop going. Don't give up. Don't quit. I got, I'm here for you. It's not going to fall. I'll join with you in prayer. When's the last time you encouraged someone in that way? Because that, my friend, is what we are called to do, is to build the kingdom of God. We need to build each other up. Hebrews chapter 10, let us consider how we might spur. Say spur. Ever see a cowboy with spurs on his heels? You get to do that to each other. In love. Let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds. How we might spur each other on. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. But the beginning of that passage, it said, let us consider how we might spur one another on. This is often done in our culture in church settings. It's often done through programs and events in church, by getting involved in kids' ministry, by getting involved in youth ministry, by getting involved in life groups, by getting involved in prayer ministry, by getting involved in the block party and outreaches and things like that. We are called to work at building the kingdom of God and encouraging each other all along the way. Our main passage in verse 10 of Ephesians 2 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. The church that Paul was writing to was in Ephesus, and that church did the work. They heard the message, they read the letter, and they did the work. We know that from Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know your deeds. So the 
letter to the church in Ephesus. Your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. You've tested those who claim to be apostles and are not, and you have found them to be false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. They did the work. You were created by God to do the work of the kingdom, but not alone. You are created by God to do the work of the kingdom together. We are created to be together. In Romans chapter 12, verse 5, so in Christ, we who form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We are created to do it together. Ephesians 4, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Together. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Together. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us is get each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. That's why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascend mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, and to prepare God's people for works of service, not to sit on couches and be entertained, so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We are called to be one and to be one in action. Church, we have a block party coming up next weekend, and it is not just your pastors and board putting it on. It is you. It is the church, and we are doing it together. We have ministries that are about to begin in the next few weeks that are outreaches. We have ministries of life groups. They are not to be done by one or two people, but by the church coming together in unity. We are called to action, and we are called to action together to build each other up. I ended the message last week by talking about the, the theme of the weekend was rooted. And I ended the message last week by talking about being rooted together and it fits so well here in understanding the unity that we have to have in Christ. And I mentioned redwoods. I, I've preached about them here before. It's a tree that's found in the, the California area. These trees reach upwards of over 107 meters tall. They are taller than some apartment buildings. Their combined weight of one tree is in the millions of pounds. They're so large that some of them have holes cut in that cars and trucks can drive right through the center. But they're only found on the coastal area where wind is strong, and you think, a tree that can be taller than an apartment building, how can it stand in, in, in tropical-type storms with winds that blow? These trees can grow to be over 2,000 years old. That means there are some trees in California in that area that are, that are taller than apartment buildings, that are big enough that you could drive a vehicle through them, that were started around the time Christ was on the earth. That kind of blows my mind. And they've survived storm after storm after storm after storm without toppling over. And your first thought is that their roots must go deep. They don't. These redwoods have a very shallow but wide root system. In fact, their root system will reach outwards of about 100 a, a feet out to their side. But what gives them their strength is that these, these trees grow in clusters, in circular clusters, JJ, can I bore you for a moment? I apologize ahead of time if I hurt you. I used my own son last week so that I wouldn't get in trouble, but he's not here. But see, I'm pretty sure that if I came really hard uh, and gave JJ a good shove, yeah, I'm pretty sure, good, you okay? All right, I can shove him over. I am pretty sure that if I really put my hips and my weight into it, I can knock him over. You ready? 
No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but here's the thing. Ever play that game in school? Probably outlawed now because of injuries and all the rest. But ever play Red Rover, Red Rover? I'm pretty confident that if I link arms with JJ and I say Red Rover, Red Rover, send Anna over, she ain't knocking us over. Oh, yeah. Oh, because we're rooted together. We have linked arms and we've joined together to become one and unified. Thank you, JJ. That is what these redwoods in California have done. Their root system is not deep. It is shallow. It goes out wide. But their roots begin to intertwine one with another. So much so that when their cones drop, they drop very close to the trunk of the tree. And the new trees that grow up, their roots actually latch into the roots of the older parent tree. So they're actually getting their nutrient from the roots of their parent. But it's begun intertwined with them, they become one unit. That is what we as a church are called to do. We are created by God to do the work of the kingdom together, to be rooted together so that matter, no, matter, no matter what storm may come, no matter how hard the wind is or how big the linebacker is that wants to knock you over, you are rooted together and there ain't no way that you're going to fall over because you've been called and destined to grow taller than an apartment building. That is what the church is called to do. We are called to grow so tall that the people in the community will be able to see us no matter what and it's only going to happen if we root together and do this in unity. It is not about one man. It is not about one woman. It is about Jesus Christ. It is about Jesus Christ crucified, died, buried, risen again, and living within me and you. And as we join together as the church, as the body of believers, the people out there will see something. And we are called to action to build the kingdom. So if all I have done all summer is sit on my own, then I've missed out. If all I do all winter is come to church and sit in a chair and leave and never get my hands dirty, then I've missed the calling. Even if I feel it's outside of my wheelhouse, if God puts that heart's desire in there, you are called, you are created, you are gifted, and you have a church, a body of believers that will stand over that bench with their hand under the bar saying, you got this push out another one. You got this. Come on, come on. You got this. God called you to do this. You have the desire. Come on, you can finish. I know you can. Because church, I know we can grow and impact this kingdom. Amen? Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, in this moment right now, as we look at, at what was spoken on and from your word, Lord, I just, I, just, I just bring it before you right now, and I ask that you would speak to our hearts individually here in this room. That if there be someone in here this morning that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, Father, this morning, Lord, they would feel that drawing and they would know they need a change and that they would have that conversation with you, that confession of who you are, that asking for forgiveness and making you Lord, ruler of their life. Lord, let salvation take place if they don't know you this morning. But Father, Lord, I lift up those in this room right now who are, who are serving you. But Father, their, their, their insecurities are so big. They don't feel like they're able to be used of you. They don't feel like they're, they, they can or they deserve. God, I pray that right now you would speak against their insecurities and you would remind them in this moment. Holy Spirit, begin to remind people this morning that they are created by you, that you have created them. Lord, that you have wiped their past clean, that you have gifted them. God, remind them this morning of your love for them. God, I pray that those this morning that are struggling with self-confidence and self-esteem. God, I pray that this morning that that would rise up right now, that, that self-esteem would rise up as they re are reminded of who they are in you and how you see them. And Father, for those who feel like they've just kind of got nothing to do in the kingdom, nothing to offer, God, I pray that right now in this moment, you would begin to give dreams and visions. You said in the last days you would pour out your spirit. That there would be dreams, there would be vision, that there would be prophecies. So, Father, in this moment, I ask that you would begin again to remind us of our callings. To show us of what you would have us to do even in this season in front of us. And that the ministry of this local assembly would never be lacking in those putting their hand to the plow. Father, I lift up the block party to you right now. 
let it be an amazing opportunity to witness for you. God, as some people come next weekend to go down to the fairgrounds for the the Touch a Truck event, God, I pray, Lord, that they would see something happening here. And, Lord, after going and being awed by the fire trucks and everything else, they'd come back, have fun. But, Lord, most of all, encounter one of us, your church, and build relationship and have a hunger for you develop. God, I pray over the sandwiches that are going to be made on Thursday. Lord, bless every sandwich, Father. Lord, I pray that every sandwich that gets handed out on the streets, God, Lord, you would use as a seed of love. And you would use it, Lord, to expand your kingdom. Father, I pray for every program and ministry that we have that will be launched here in the next couple of weeks, from our archery program to our youth program to to our life groups to our our Thursday prayer time. God, I pray, Lord, that you would use every aspect, Lord, to further your kingdom as your church gets busy at the work you've called us to do. We thank you, Jesus, for putting us in this place, knitting us together as one family. May we be unified, not only in our presence, but may we be unified in our conversation about each other. May we be unified in heart. May we be unified in action. And may we expand your kingdom as we trust in you and you work through us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Be blessed. Don't forget that there is sandwiches on Thursday at 9.30, block party on Saturday. And if you're not volunteer, if you don't want to sign up for anything and you just want to be a floater, let us know that so we can make sure we put you to, to action while you're here. And if you're a visitor, please come and talk to my wife so we can set up an appointment to get together, get to know each other a little more. Be blessed. Have a wonderful week.